If uh, the clerk could please call the roll. Carr. Daniels. Here. Frost. Gaylord. Here. Gitta. Here. Hansen. Harris. Here. Kennedy. Lamson. Here. Lee. Here. Natoli. Here. Peters. Cerna. Here. And Terry. We have a quorum. Great. Uh, if everyone could please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, good. If the uh, board clerk could please read the announcement for those in the uh, watching on TV. This meeting of the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District is cablecast live without interruption on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on Comcast Consolidated Communications and AT&T U-verse cable systems. This meeting is being closed captioned and will be webcast at www.sacmetrocable.tv. Today's meeting will be repeated on Monday, March 4th at 9 a.m. and Wednesday, March 6th at 1 p.m. on channel 14. Members of the audience wishing to address the board should fill out a speaker form located on the table at the back of the chambers and give it to the clerk. Please speak into the microphone when addressing the board and state your name for the record. Also, at this time, please silence your cell phones until the conclusion of today's meeting. Thank you very much. Um, before we uh, ask the clerk to read the uh, first item or the consent calendar, um, we do have a closed session after this and we need to maintain a quorum for that. So I um, just wanted to give members a note of that. Uh, we are pulling, I believe, item number five and rescheduling that to, um, uh, to uh, the uh, following March meeting. Um, and we have a few discussion items, but uh, I just wanted to make sure that we have enough time for a closed session here. So thank you. If the clerk could yeah. please uh, read the first item. First item on the consent calendar is the January 24th, 2019 Board of Directors meeting minutes. Mm -hmm. Item two, Twin Rivers Unified School District contract, low emission vehicle incentive program. Item three, public accessible electric vehicle, vehicle charging stations. Okay, is there a motion for the consent calendar? So moved. Is there, it's been moved? It's been moved and seconded, moved by uh, board member Harris and seconded by Vice Chair Frost. Uh, any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Measure passes. Okay, if the clerk could please read the next item. <coughs> item number four on the discussion calendar, Assembly Bill 617, South Sacramento, Florin Community Steering Committee introduction, and I have David Yang with our Program Coordination Department to give the presentation. Good morning. Uh, David Yang, I am the program supervisor for the program coordination division and today I will uh, give you guys an update on the progress of developing our um, air, air monitoring program for our AB 617 year one community. Um, as you may recall, we submitted uh, 10 recommended um, community areas to CARB um, and fortunately community C was selected for year one implementation for and monitoring. Um, a steering committee was formed uh, to help advise the district to uh, advise the district in developing the air monitoring plan. Uh, the steering committee are, uh, consists of community members who live, work, or own businesses in the uh, selected area. Um, as we look forward to year two where CARB is a uh, uh, we'll be soon uh, accepting recommendations um, in the near future. We wanted to just present uh, our efforts on what we're currently doing with our year one community. Uh, today we have had three meetings. Uh, most recently we had one this past Tuesday where we had uh, a various discussion on air quality concerns that the community members have brought up and they, they have provided um, valuable information that will be included in the air monitoring plan. Um, um, also, um, 
so um, the, the next steps um, in in uh, the, the next upcoming circuit meetings will be, um, you know, we will be, we'll hope to develop uh, monitoring objectives and uh, determine potential monitoring locations uh, for for our mo air monitoring. Um, to provide a community's perspective on these efforts, I want to introduce uh, Bill Norton, who is the uh, uh, director of the Macro Partnership and chair of the steering committee. Bill. Good morning, Mr. Knowlton. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for, for allowing me to speak with you just for a minute or so. Uh, first thing I would like to say is thank you. Thank you for allowing me to, to speak with you. And thank you to the staff who has really helped us in our, in our steering committee. Uh, we have learned a lot about the different pollutants, uh, the dangers that they, that they present both long-term and short-term. So the education for us as a steering committee has been, has been a, a steep one. Uh, I've learned more acronyms and, and, and different forms of pollution that, I, that I, I'm reading books and I'm going, boy, I, I, I need to go back to my, my dictionary. And so that learning curve has been a steep one because we're on time constraints. Uh, we have met, as, as David said, three times. We are gonna meet uh, twice next month again because of the time constraints that we have. So I will say that our, our committee is a, is a diverse committee. Uh, we have business people, we have residents, we have local business leaders and, and, and community folks who are all participating. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion around priorities, uh, what's important to the community. And I, and I think it's important to, to, to point out that this is one of the few times where, where the, as, as government funnels down, it really funnels down to a community, an underserved community, and, and that's important. As we all know, many of our underserved communities are uh, underserved for a reason, because there hasn't been focus on some of these, on some of these communities. And so we're, we're very, very grateful, and, and we're, we're happy to be a part of this this conversation, uh, we have uh, in our in our steering committee meetings, we have forty to fifty people that attend, which is which we were very very pleased. We we thought that we would have our steering committee and a few you know folks who uh, would like to to join in. It's a huge uh, group of pope people with very diverse ideas of what what needs to be done. And so we were pleased with that. So we keep adding chairs, and people keep, uh, keep adding and bringing people uh, to this conversation. So we're very pleased with that. Uh, really, the topics of interest are around okay. traffic being the number one, the number one issue for, for folks. Uh, you know, vehicles, vehicles that are, that are sitting idling, school buses that are sitting at, idling at, 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 you know, obviously at schools. And so that is, that's, that's a big piece of, of where their first conversation went was around traffic. Uh, I, was, I was honored to be a part uh, of, a, of a traffic study that is, that is starting in the city of Sacramento and went to that conversation uh, day before yesterday, and it really dovetailed into what what we're doing here. I, I know uh, Councilman Carr has worked very, very hard on traffic issues on Mac Road, and now looking at that Mac Road corridor, Bruceville, uh, the Stockton Boulevard interchange. So there's a lot of conversations on not so much as how many cars go through, but how long do they stay there? And and when we had our conversation with our staff they were very clear that, that one of the worst places in Sacramento was my office. It was very, very clear. And they said, you are, <laughs> you're there. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. those things really resonate with, with the steering committee and with, with, the, with the community at large. So again, a, a big thank you to our, to our staff and to you. Um, really, a lot of, a lot of the conversation has been around environmental justice issues. And the, the, the underserved communities don't enjoy that same level, again, of attention that some other communities get. So really it's about environmental justice. It's really about building a healthy community. That at the end of the day, 
That's really what, what we're looking to do. And in closing, I would say that the overarching, I think, theme and goal of the steering committee is just that, building those, those healthy communities, social equity, economic development, which is huge. Without jobs, without economic development, we can't, we can't rise or raise our communities up. We can't social service our way into prosperity. We, we have to create jobs. So all of these things together go to that one overarching goal is to build a healthy community. So I am I'm proud to, to be of service to my community, proud to be with very, very smart people and, and learning uh, about our next steps. Thank well, you. thank you very much, Mr. Knowlton, for uh, taking the lead on that. And you've been <clears throat> an active member of the both Stockton Boulevard and Mac Road community and in that area of ensuring that there's uh, activity and in, uh, in improving the quality of life of folks of there. I do want to commend uh, our uh, board members uh, Cerna and Carr for their uh, their advocacy on this issue both at the local and state level on that and I see uh, our board member Cerna is punched up to speak here. Uh, this is a re receive and file and uh, thank you Mr. Knowlton. Yeah. Thank you Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm not sure if this is um this question is best aimed at Bill or for um, for air pollution control officer, but help me understand the map that now has been up for a few minutes um, and the criteria that was used to, um, not just as it relates to the foreign community, but to all of the blue polygons here. What does it mean in the buffers? What, what, do, what are the criteria that Feed so, into that. so I'd be happy to address that uh, briefly. Um, so the board that you, the other board that you sit on, the Air Resources Board, uh, they issued to Air Districts guidance in terms of the level of information and analysis that they wanted to see that a district would follow to identify communities. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we developed an analysis that was submitted to ARB about a year ago and that was discussed uh, for the board here. And we basically looked at the different tools and indicators that we have in the region to identify these priority communities. The indicators are things like the Calvin virus screen, but because we know the Calvin virus screen has several shortcomings, we didn't stop there. Our analysis went beyond and we looked at a number of other issues, like for example, where are our sensitive receptors located relative to sources? Uh, we benefit in the region because we have information about uh, the community health needs assessment that some of the, hosp the public hospitals have. So what we did is we looked at about seven, uh, six or seven different indicators and uh, essentially put it into an analysis that highlighted the priority area. So these are the areas that are most susceptible to uh, air pollution uh, as well as some of the other health uh, determinants uh, that are important to, to protect public health. And our 10 communities, as you see here, were submitted to the Air Resources Board. As you well know, the Air Board selected 10 communities throughout the state. So we are one of 10, and the same process that you just heard Mr. Mr. Nolan describe is happening throughout the, uh, throughout the state. So um, thank you for the explanation. But uh, I just want to be clear that there is socioeconomic information that feeds into this as well, right? That's the yeah. disadvantaged. Um, I still remain perplexed because, um, and I know this is a bit after the fact, but I, I just want to put it on the record, and I know I've been, speaking of records, I've been a bit of a broken one on this, but uh, if you look at this map, knowing the community that I've grown up in that I know like the back of my hand, and seeing that places like Land Park and Curtis Park, um, relatively um, affluent areas are at least within the half mile community buffer but then places like South Oak Park are not in, in even the half mile community buffer I don't understand it and I want to understand it and I don't want to jump to conclusions but um, uh, I, I know some of it's based on science right it's based on the air quality uh, thresholds and pollution thresholds and then parts of it are uh, based on that is the cartography the map making is based on the the socioeconomic uh, part so um, how do I how do I reconcile this 
So, so really good points, and again, I'm, I'm going to point to the discussions that, that you and your fellow board members at ARB have had on this, and that is um, transportation emissions are the great equalizer, right? Because for a region like our region, and most of California is under the same impact, when you are impacted by pollution from transportation, as we are, you essentially have pollution distributed all over the place. And one of the key indicators that was included in our analysis was analysis and modeling that ARB did for all districts that track diesel PM pollution. Mm -hmm. And when you, when, you, when you recognize that, you basically see these impacts. The second thing is, I think the point that you're making is really well taken, and ARB recognizes that we need to start getting away from, from this idea of very discrete boundaries. Um, in the discussions we had with you leading up to this, you talked about the heat map. So one of the things that we are enjoying, and this is a really good thing, is the Air Board and the Air Districts, working with the steering committee, are going to have quite a bit of latitude and flexibility in terms of not thinking of the lines as hard lines, but rather just a guiding. We need an administrative definition of what the community is. But beyond that, we're certainly not going to be constrained to understanding the air pollution impacts that are just inside the, the line. So. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's moving in the right direction from my perspective. And, and anything that you can do at the Air Resources Board to give us all more flexibility rather than constrain us to these hard definitions is a good thing. When is the next opportunity to affect that? So I'm going to get into that a little bit in my report later. But uh, as Mr. Norton uh, suggested, uh, this is year one community. And as you can see, we have 10 communities. So the idea is that this is going to be an annual process. In the current year and in the next couple of months, we are going to be approaching you and the other uh, board members at ARB to uh, recommend that the Air Resources Board select a second community for the Sacramento region. Other air districts, other regions are going to be doing the same thing. And I think at that point, that will be an opportunity for you, the Air Resources, as an Air Resources Board member, uh, to raise questions in terms about, um, you know, where we are. I can tell you things are getting better, and I'll talk about this because, you know, right now we show A and B as two discrete communities. Our recommendation is going to be just lump those two. There's really no distinction between the two. Let us just make that area in the Norwood um, neighborhood our next priority. So, so when we have that kind of next round of consideration in terms of the geography that's involved, um, will we be limited to just uh, this universe of polygons, or is that is it wide open again in terms of re-exploring re kind of the very point that I that I've attempted to make several times now about about this particular neighborhood, about South Oak Park. Um, because I, I again, I know it's you're hearing concerns expressed based on anecdotal information by one board member here, but again, knowing this area the way I do, its proximity to Highway 99, it being one of the uh, poorest uh, areas, not just in the county of Sacramento, but in the six-county region, it, it it baffles me why it's not, and it never seems to enter the conversation that it's not on the map. So I'm, I'm hopeful that what you're, how you're going to respond is, yes, we're going to have the opportunity to, to re-explore all areas and not just limit ourselves to the, the discrete polygons on the, on the, the map. So, so that, that is precisely the, the answer, yes. Okay, and but what I want to point out to you is, I think really the forum for that is not our board, but the Air Resources Board. Because yeah. you as an ARB board member have all the latitude to raise any questions that you deem are adequate. Mm -hmm. The second thing, I, I, I don't know. ARB staff hasn't communicated to us precisely what the plan is for a year to uh, a community identification, so maybe that's a question that you can take back to them. My understanding at the moment is that the Air Resources <coughs> Board delegated authority for the staff to essentially just identify the, the year two community and move forward. My recommendation, my desire would be that the board gets an opportunity to engage so that some of us that are going to be proposing a community can come and have a discussion and tell you why we think, one, we need to be included as a year two community, and two, why a community such as the Norwood uh, neighborhood is important from our perspective. And I think in that context, you have complete latitude to, to raise questions about the boundaries. Here's what I'd like to do. Uh, here's what I'd like to propose is that uh, you and I um, make time and um, we not waste any time and we go meet with uh, Richard Corey 
uh, about this very issue and do it uh, in the near future. Not kind of, you know, I don't want to wait for the process to take its time to tee up. I want it to be known extremely early about this ARB board member's concern about the ongoing concern I have about this, both uh, in my role here and over there. I, I really thank you for you know putting a big bright spotlight on this issue, and um, I think thinking ahead, you know, is, is we are going to do everything we can to understand better how air pollution is impacting our communities. Again, whether it's in, inside or outside of the boundary, no question. But I think the next critical question is, so what are we going to do about it? And the presentation that you're going to hear in a moment from Mr. Lemus is going to try to get into, uh, this is all about opportunity. Because again, having communities, having identified needs is going to give us a better argument to try to reach to the state and access cap and trade funding. Why is the funding important? Because that's how we're going to get reductions, right. right? That's how we can buy cleaner transportation and cleaner, hopefully, businesses, which for the first time are included in a program. So maybe after you hear uh, Mr. Lemus's presentation, that will give you a, a better context. And absolutely, I mean, we are engaged with uh, ARB staff uh, all the time, and uh, we very much welcome uh, uh, direct uh, engagement from a board member. Thank you, Dr. Riala. Thank you, uh, Board Member Cerna. In fact, uh, Board Member Cerna just spoke, just uh, took the words right out of my mouth. I think it, it would also be helpful for any of the staff who are, or board members who are interested in um, uh, speaking up at the ARB meeting if prior to that uh, there is an opportunity for us as board members to sit down with some of your analysts so we can okay. understand and better articulate the concerns we have with the, the rubric that's been used to uh, identify these locations. I, for one, would want to be one of those folks, but uh, again, I think to uh, board member Cerna's point is that uh, I don't want to wait till the next year before we come around. I think there there is a lot to be um, uh, uh, not, not I'm not just happy, but what's the word? Uh, to, to be grateful about, but yeah. also excited about that we have one of 10 in the state to be selected for an area. There's a lot of need throughout the state. And the fact that it was both in the uh, incorporated and unincorporated area showed, I think, it's uh, the, the importance of that. Uh, but with that, this is a receive and file. And um, since there are no other board members, and I think our next presentation will actually lead into a little more of the uh, uh, meat on the bones for this discussion, um, I'll ask the clerk to uh, call the next item. Item number six, Community Air Protection Incentive Program. And I have Jaime Lemos with our Transportation Department, who will be giving you a presentation. And I just want to make note that there has been a slight change to slide number two, which is provided to you up at the podium. Um, and it will also be reflected in the minutes. Good morning. Good morning, Chair, members of the board. My name is Jaime Lemos, and I'm the Acting Division Manager for the Transportation and Climate Change Division. And I'll be presenting today on the Community Air Protection Incentive Program, which is a hot topic. A little bit about the history of our incentive programs. We've had the privilege of managing our incentive programs for many years. Many of you are very familiar with these programs. These are the CCAP program, the Moyer program, and the GMERP programs. These programs have targeted mobile sources that impact our entire air basin. Down below is the map of our Sacramento Federal Non-Attainment Area, or the SFNA map. And so we target a region-wide uh, area and create programs and provide incentives to participants that operate in and out of our SFNA area. The programs that we target, or the programs target the heavy duty and agriculture equipment. And these programs typically are not designed um, to uh, region by region. A little bit of what has happened since we've been managing these programs is as technology has evolved, our programs have also evolved. We've been looking at the way that we've impacted our entire air basin and looking at regional wide benefits and now moving towards localized impacts. We're looking at focusing on zero emission, mobility strategies, equity, and the light duty sector very different from our most current uh, programs. Many of you are familiar with our car share program, which we started a few years ago. 
This is the prime example of our evolution of our programs. We are now currently in phase two and wrapping that up. Uh, we have sites at Marina Vista, River Garden, Sky Park, and soon to be completed Greenway. This year we'll be focusing on year three of the car share program. And in year three, we're looking at creating DAC mobility hubs that provide needs for transportation deserts. We're looking at visa card options for all forms of transportation alternatives. We're looking at integrating jump bike and we're looking at more sites and more partners. And as we continue to deploy more sites, we'll be sure to engage with you in your office. Soon to come, will be Clean Cars for All, which we'll have a presentation for you in the next, next, uh, next couple board meetings. So this is the map that's very popular. These are our 10 selected uh, communities throughout, our, our, throughout the Sacramento County. And we are running currently, as you mentioned, the Community Air Protection Program. And the Community Air Protection Program comes from the California Cap and Trade uh, Program or the GGRF funding. This is for, we're currently right now we're working on year one, which we've received about $3.6 million to focus in Sacramento and Yolo County. The $3.6 million will focus on all of these 10 identified communities. And we'll be looking at specific localized benefits and working with community members, community organizations, and our partners throughout these identified communities. Now, we have here circled uh, the, the South Sacramento Florin area, which you've heard um, the chair of the steering committee, Bill, speak about. And so just to be clear, this is, also, this is for year two. So most of what I'm speaking about right now and presenting on is on the efforts that we've been working on for year one. So for year one funding, we've continued the community engagement throughout all 10 identified communities. We've identified projects that, I, that align with community priorities. And here's the challenge. The projects that we are developing must align and must adhere to the Carl Moyer guidelines, which means that they target mostly heavy-duty on-road and off-road equipment, infrastructure projects like electric charging and alternative fueling stations, and have a cost effectiveness of $30,000 to about $276,000 per ton. And most importantly, I think one of the biggest challenges here is that a vehicle must be surrendered for scrap. So as the chair of the steering committee has mentioned, as we've been talking about, we're focusing on areas that have been disproportionately impacted by air pollution with limited resources. And so here our team has to develop projects in conjunction with community members and organizations and trying to develop projects that really make an impact in these communities. So it's really difficult. We're working with ARB staff to try to stretch those guidelines a little bit. In the community, we hear a lot of need about additional transit stops, um, additional transit routes, and many other forms of even alternative uh, forms of transportation like jump bike and just better sidewalks, many of which do not fall within our car or Moyer guidelines. So we're working with ARB staff in order to see if there's something that we can do to try to enhance or to try to meet some of those needs. Question? question? Yes. Okay. Yeah, um, I mean, so it relates to uh, the uh, heavy duty vehicles and you have in, in, in some of the, the target area, you have some industrial uh, portions and there's adjacent industrial areas obviously where you have firms that uh, move goods, uh, certainly on-site, load them off and on. Um, and if you're looking at areas that uh, may have a, um, a challenge associated with economic um, framework, and uh, presuming for a moment some of those folks that, that work there, live there, may even own their own vehicles, and you're looking for vehicle scrap, it's one thing if you have a, you know, a, uh, a firm that you're dealing with that may have a, a, a fleet, but if you have individual owners and or leased 
vehicles. Uh, you know, scrapping is one thing, but replacement isn't full replacement, uh, you know, generally, if, if I recall. And even when we went into this with independent operators and so forth a few years ago, folks were doing well when the economy was booming in the construction industry, for example. Bottom fell out of that, and guess what? Folks, you know, were in over their ears as, as related to uh, either liens on their, on their vehicles and so forth. So understanding, you know, on the kind of the micro, when you're looking at some of the things that may not fit neatly with Carl Moyer, but it's still going back to the bigger part of the program, you don't have a lot of agricultural production in that area. Uh, you may have some urban gardens and so forth. So how is it that you strategize that, particularly when you don't have larger firms you can deal with? Uh, and these, you know, small operators that maybe, you know, maybe they come to cooperatives, I don't know. But, you know, you, 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 I think about that when it comes to even some of the medium duty vehicles. Uh, and, and then you say, well, we can give you a $50,000 loan, but in order to replace that, it's gonna cost you $150,000 or $200,000 for a cleaner vehicle. That just becomes out of the realm. Either the, they don't have that credit standing to do that or the capacity to you know, even make the payments, even if, they're, you know, even if they could qualify for the loan. No, the point is well taken, and this is a challenge that we, we struggle with internally with our team, and how do we create an incentive package that we can really incentivize the participant, really make it effective and impactful for them? As we look at some of the fleets, especially in the South Sacramento Florin area, and we look at Expo and Pepsi and different companies who can afford it, the technology is still developing as well. And so now we have challenges that are presented in the technology and in the cost effectiveness. And so these are conversations that we're having with ARB right now about creating a, a better package potentially uh, and even working with our other programs um, like CCAT and other buckets of money that we have in order to try to pair those to try to create a better incentive package. So I, I, we definitely agree with that and, and um, we have a great team that's just continuously working on trying to develop these great packages. And Mr. Lima, what you're also saying is that we have to continue to advocate at the, at the state regulatory level for that understanding of that local issue. That's right. So let me give you an example because I knew this would come up. So a few a few months ago, I presented on um, on some of uh, on a uh, at McClellan there was a heavy duty alternative expo there, and Director Guerra was there present as well as as well as Director Serna, but there was a vehicle there called the Thor Class Eight tractor trailer, so that vehicle is around two hundred fifty thousand uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and uh, it's a Class Eight truck, and it can operate for about. Uh, I think it's around 250 miles is the range. And the max incentive that we can provide with the CAP program is $62,000. So we have a range issue, we have a technology issue, and we have an incentive issue. So we have to try and create these better packages internally so that we can offer it to our communities. And at the same time, we're working with ARB to try to push those limits. One of the efforts that we're doing now is, uh, many of you are familiar with our CCAP program where we offer 100,000 for innovative equipment, zero emission uh, vehicles. So we're trying to integrate the CCAP program into the Community Air Protection Incentive Program. And then we're trying to couple the, the dollars together to try to provide a larger incentive. So a lot of work that we have coming forward. So here's the creative list that our team has worked on, along with community members, partners, and, and organizations. As you see in the middle column, the project description, are the type of categories that the AB 617 Community Air Protection <coughs> Incentive Guidelines allows. So electric vehicle charging infrastructure, EV school bus, which falls into heavy duty. Now if you look at the project names, they don't, you know, they have a, a, a little indicator as to what really the project is, like the DAC Mobility Hub, which is uh, a project that we're working on in the Del Paso community. Uh, this project will have a micro shuttle, also partnered with car share programs. We're looking into having jump bike also integrated into this. So we're pulling resources from all different areas and different programs to create a mobility hub in the Del Paso area. 
and the community air protection program will fund only the electric vehicle charging infrastructure. So our team is really strategizing on how to develop these programs. And this list was also emailed to you and to all our community <coughs> members uh, involved with AB 617 as part of the process uh, of identifying the, uh, pot the potential projects. As you can see on row three, these projects almost fit in all of those identified communities. Now for year two, which we currently are in now, we will focus on the South Sacramento Florin area, and we're working with Bill and the steering committee and other organizations to identify transformational projects that fit the community needs. We're looking in the range of 12 to 15 million dollars in funding. Uh, we're still waiting for the Air Resources Board to, uh, for the award. And we'll be reaching out or continuing the outreach to community organizations, uh, different, board, uh, different boards like the PBIDs and different constituents. And we'll also be working with the steering committee. Most of, the, most of the dollars programmed for year two will have to focus on the South Sacramento Florin area. But we will also work with the Air Resources Board and some flexibility in, in creating projects that also meet the other nine identified communities as well. And the community engagement has already been, been in process for those communities. Do I have any questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Limas. Uh, first, I, I do want to thank, uh, thank you for you and all your staff for understanding and recognizing uh, the challenges that we have in executing the, the air quality goals um, that, that are set for us at the statewide level but also not forgetting the need for them as well. So I do want to thank you for that, and I don't see any comments from uh, the board members. Again, this is another uh, receive and file on this item. Uh, and if uh, there are no comments, we'll go ahead and ask the clerk uh, to uh, uh, read the next item. But by the way, that, that uh, electric truck was a pretty cool truck too, though. That was The next item on the agenda is the Air Pollution Control Officer's Report. <clears throat> Thank you, and uh, as the slides uh, come up, uh, let, me, let me offer a couple of observations from the previous discussion. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Notoli, for bringing up the issue of incentive programs. Um, fundamentally, there is really no reason why we as public uh, officials, you, uh, the Air Resources Board, you could not uh, structure an incentive program that, play, that pays for the full replacement of cost of a vehicle. I think the balance is just, um, you know, the state and, and, and others are trying to stretch the money a little bit more. The tension we have now is, as Mr. Guerra noted, is the technology that is coming, the one that we want to get access to, is more expensive, right? It's still very expensive. So I think that's, we're in the middle of that. We're certainly advocating to the state that we want more flexibility because, you know, going by the program uh, guidelines from Carl Moyer, very successful program, has been around for ages, an invention of Sacramento, you should know that. Uh, it was very effective because there was a lot of low-hanging fruit. That low-hanging fruit is gone, right? So I think we do need to uh, be willing to uh, uh, entertain an evolution of those guidelines, and we need your help because, again, we need to advocate uh, to the state and to others uh, to give us the flexibility and make sure that we can be the most effective that we, that we can be. And then the second point I'll make is, um, you know, this is a very meaningful amount of money for us, but obviously it's not going to be enough to affect the change that we know we need. So one of the things that we're trying to do regionally is to be strategic and smart about leveraging these funds with the funding that other agencies are going to be making, sister agencies like Sacramento RT and SACOG and STA, for example. Right now we're talking a lot about Stockton Boulevard and you know, dreaming some of the great things that we all together uh, could do if, if we are smart about leveraging investments. So that's really the opportunity before us. Um, we talk We already talked a lot about AB 617 and community, so I'll make it really quick. Uh, it was a really good discussion. So we're in the middle of this next round. And um, as we discussed, we identified 10 communities throughout our region. One was selected. 
uh, we are getting ready to propose to the uh, Resources Board to uh, agree with us and accept the recommendation that the Sacramento region gets a second community. And the second community is uh, the community that you see in the circle, is what I call the Norwood um, neighborhood. And for those of you that are familiar, again, the impact is going to be industrial sources, um, or rather transportation sources because of the busy uh, freeways and all the industry uh, related. Uh, and again, the idea is that by having an identified community, it will trigger another process similar to what Mr. Nolden described in terms of us going in there doing a, a, a hyper-assessment, if you will, at the, at the very localized community level to try to understand more precisely the, uh, the impacts from air pollution in that area. And then, in addition to air monitoring that will give us that information, to then work with uh, Mr. Lemos and, and the incentive programs to try to bring some investments to mitigate the impact. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what, that's what this is about. The Air Resources Board talked a lot about you can go into a community, you can engage the community, you can do all the monitoring you want, but this is about action. So we are about uh, developing emission reduction plans that very precisely target the impacts that we will identify with the help of the community and then identifying things that we can do, things that we can invest on to make sure that we can Board get some benefit. Board member Cerna has a question here. So um, in terms of that, that prospective second uh, community, and I appreciate the fact that you pointed out um, that the uh, AB distinction is going to be or, or you're hoping that it will be combined, that makes a lot of sense. Um, one thing that occurs to me is in um, making the case that this be selected uh, in this second round, um, you might want to explore what the Army Corps of Engineers expects to be doing in terms of ongoing uh, construction activity, especially um, kind of medium haul uh, truck traffic. There's going to be a lot of it in terms of the levee work along the southerly uh, border of the Natomas Basin and then up the southeast corner of the, the NEMDEC. Um, and I can tell you, uh, living out by the area that has been completed to date in terms of the levee improvements around the entire basin, there's an extraordinary amount of truck traffic. So I think that has to be, even though that's that's somewhat um, episodic. It's not going to be that way forever, but it's going to be significant in terms of its uh, impact from uh, that particular mobile source. And those are going to be that's going to be de diesel particulate pollution. So I think we need to make sure we keep that in mind. And you know, when we're making the case about not just kind of the uh, the condition of this area, um, regardless of uh, of that. Uh, construction activity, but um, especially because of that construction activity, it's even more so uh, an appropriate candidate for consideration. No, the, uh, very well taken, and I want to give you some assurance. We actually consider that point very, very much. As, as you know, we have a group of, of experts in our, in our agency that uh, deal with land use and CEQA planning processes, and that was one of the very things that we looked into Good. it. Um, it, it, it definitely impacts us because, again, you know, we're, we're talking about the future, right? It's going to take time to, to, to get the change that we need, and those are the kinds of impacts. And this is why we need the state and the Air Resources Board to recognize that every community is different. You cannot have a one-size cookie-cutter approach to, to every, every community because everything is different. And uh, those are the kinds of messages that we want to convey. Good. And I think Board Member Harris also has a question here, comment. Thank you, Chair. I, I'd just like to build on what Director Cerna said. The SAFCA project's time horizon is, you know, five to seven years. So although he called it episodic, it's really, in my mind, more long term. And the effects of those projects are going to be significant for quite a while. So I'm, I'm glad they're on your radar and that you're looking that, at that from the CEQA perspective because um, there will be impacts. For, for a sustained period of time. And, and just to give the board members uh, some reassurance, I mean, you know, the, the fundamental premise of environmental management is you cannot manage that that you cannot measure. So part of what we're going to do in Mr. Norton's community as well as the second community, if the Air Resources Board accepts a recommendation, and we'll bring, bring you back an update, we're actually going to be doing very highly localized air quality monitoring. 
So we're developing a mobile lab. We're going to deploy some low-cost sensors that we can, you know, uh, saturate the region with. So the idea would be that, you know, we're not going to just go in there and just pretend that there's going to be a change over time. We're actually going to have the tools to track what these episodic impacts uh, will be. And this is a really good thing, again, because, you know, up to now, without AB 617, we could not have been able to do this. So um, I, for one, I think this is a great program. I, I know you hear me talk a lot about the challenges that we as an air district have. But I mean, I think this is the right thing to do. We finally, as a society, accepted the fact that we need to focus on those that need it the most. And clearly, air pollution is, is, a, yeah. is a top uh, level priority for us. And I think leading up to your next uh, item on your uh, report, uh, obviously the, the truck impacts of the recovery of the um, wildfire responses is, is a big one as well. So here, what I wanted to do, given the importance, is, you know, I don't, I'm not going to give you any conclusions or, or final outcomes, but I just want the board to be aware of, of uh, what's going on in, in your district. Um, I included a little bit of information in the last uh, APCO report at the last board meeting. You may recall we didn't actually have a presentation, so it's in your packet. But what I wanted to just make you aware of is that we are in the middle of some really significant and good regional coordination about what to do when the next fire comes. Obviously, the campfire, and you were getting our notices and, and, and information, it hit the Sacramento region very heavily. It hit many areas. But this was really uh, the one that hit us the most. We set pollution levels that we have never seen in the past. We broke records. Uh, and that's not anything to be proud of. It's just the reality of our changing climate and the things that we have to be ready for. And right now, we're talking to the city of Sacramento, not only the city of Sacramento, we're going to be talking to all the jurisdictions. We're obviously in very close contact with our health officer at the county and many other agencies. I think everybody understands that we're going to, we want to be better prepared in terms of the communication, in terms of the response that we as a region have when the next fire hits us. Uh, there is, as many of you know, know uh, a lot of legislative interest in this. There's a lot of state representatives that want to help, want to do something. Uh, we're fortunate because we are part of the conversation as well. Uh, a lot of it is, is just making sure that we also have access to uh, federal resources. The U.S. Forest Service, they have been great. They want to help. But again, we, we need to engage and, 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 and sort of... Um, you know, give some recommendations in terms of what we at the local level need the most. The schools and school notification is a big issue, right? I mean, we got into a, a very significant and confusing controversy about do you close schools, do you not close schools? So we need to, uh, we all understand that we need to have the conversation and be better prepared for that. Um, there's a lot of things that are on the table, and again, I'm not, I can't tell you where we're going to land. I just want you to be aware of the kinds of things that we're talking about. Uh, cleaner centers and uh, areas within the schools and businesses and public places where you can have, you know, high efficiency filtration so that in the event that we see another campfire impact, at least you have a place that you can go for some clean air for, for some time. Um, I talked about sensors. I think uh, these are coming. People are buying them online. They are deploying them and using them because the information goes online. So we as an air agency, we need, I want to get in front of it. Right? Because it's so easy to push a button and get a number. But how do you know if it's a good number? What does it mean? So I think that's a role that, that we as air agencies can play. Outdoor air pollution, obviously, within our purview. But what about indoor air pollution? You know, one of, the, one of the most difficult calls that we kept getting, and we were not the only ones, but people were saying, it's really bad inside where I am at. You know, what do I do? And, you know, my recommendation just right off the back was, I know it's inside, it's bad inside, but it's much more worse outside, so stay inside, please. So, but we can do better, right? I mean, we can develop some guidance. Um, you know, the issue of the, of the mass. Uh, I, don't, I don't need to tell you there, you were reading everything and in the middle of it. So, there's a lot happening. We're gonna bring you updates, again, just so that you know where we are. And I'm sure you're gonna hear about this in your own respective capacities as elected officials in the region. Yeah, thank you very much. And I had seen a, that uh, there's a private company now on purple air sensors where individual folks are buying their own air sensor for their home or backyard to kind of gauge that uh, um, their own local impacts. I think if we figure out in the future how to normalize and, and crowdsource uh, that data, I think it'd be helpful. I think you have your next item. Uh, yes, so I'm going to defer to uh, Ms. Mowens to introduce our uh, newest employee. 
Good morning, uh, Chair Guerra and, and directors. My name is Jamil Moons. I'm the Administrative Services uh, Division Manager here at the district. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Ms. Jana Lewin. I hear it. Jana uh, joined us recently and we're very, very excited to have her. Uh, the controller is obviously a very critical position in our organization and we're thrilled to have her. She has uh, many, many years experience in finance and accounting. She tells me her stories as a high schooler uh, taking a temporary job in accounting and knew that's exactly what she wanted to do. Uh, but before she did that, she wanted some excitement. So she went and joined the Army. And uh, she spent a few years in the Army there on active duty, and when she came back, she continued her service with the National Guard uh, and went back to school and got her education up through a, an MBA in finance and accounting. And uh, recently, she spent seven years as a controller at her former employer. So we have a very, very experienced individual joining us. Uh, her primary experience is with the private sector, which is, is fun and exciting to, to bring that experience over to the government sector as well. So we're, we're thrilled to have uh, Jana join us. And we just wanted to let you know that uh, she's with our team now. Thank you. Well, let's give uh, Jana a uh, welcome aboard. A round of applause. Thank you for your service and thank you for continuing to serve. And uh, we have a member of the Army family here as well that we also uh, recognize as well. Yeah. Good. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, that's an exciting way to end the, uh, the, the regular business of our meeting. I think we're at uh, public comment at this moment. Is that correct? We are, and we do not have any public comment today. We have no items. Uh, no one signed up for public comment. Uh, with that, I believe we are now at comments of the board ideas and comments. Any board members with ideas and comments? Uh, any announcements? If there are no announcements. We're going ahead and um, um, adjourn to closed session. And uh, we do have an action item, so if we can have everyone stick around, and we hope to get out of here before 10 o'clock. Thanks, guys. Adjourn to closed session.